live from the East Lansing Underground. This is 88.9, bringing you the basement as always. Thursdays, 8 to 10 p.m. I am the host, Liv. And I am Griffin. We have a lovely band in studio tonight called Queen Jane. Would you all take a second to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Tanner. I'm the lead singer and lead guitarist. Hi, I'm Lee. I'm the rhythm guitarist. I'm Eric Zuby. I'm the drummer. I'm Colton Proctor. I'm the bass player. Sing backups. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Um, let's start the way that we always start. I'd love to jump right in, and y'all can just show our listeners what you're about. There's something about you, babe, that I just can't put away. That was awesome. Once again, this is The Basement, and you are listening to Queen Jane. And that song was The Groove. Now, I want to know, uh, what made you want to write the song Groove? And second of all, who is Queen Jane? Well, the second question is kind of a long story. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, the first question was is kind of like, uh, that, that song's been around for a while and gone through a lot of evolution. Like, it, it changed numerous times over the last, like, well, I want to say, like, five six years and uh so it's, it's been around a while but it was initially about you know trying to get back with somebody who you know had left your life and it was you know they were important to you and then things kind of get complicated you go back and forth after a while that's kind of like this whole generation really is dealing with that so it felt very relatable uh and then it turned more into like a lifestyle choice of like i know i want this lifestyle don't know if I can have it, but I'm ready to do it, if that makes sense. So it kind of turned from a relationship thing more into like a wanting a lifestyle and not sure if it'll choose you type of thing. Okay, but we also are dying to know, who is Queen Jane? <laughs> well, so Queen Jane herself was actually a real queen. 
back in the 1500s. And we got the name originally from a song from Bob Dylan called A Letter to Queen Jane. Uh, and she was known as the Nine Day Queen uh, because she was uh, killed by her family and things like that. Like she was betrayed by the whole kingdom. And uh, she wanted to go more of like the freedom route for the people. And she was considered an Ill illegitimate child. And it kind of felt right to be like, A, that's Murica for wanting freedom. And B, that's kind of like, you know, the black sheep of the family gets the down part of the spoon type of deal. Now, where did you find this story? Where did you find this history? And then why was that motivated to uh, name your band that? I mean, we found it just by looking it up after we saw it or heard Bob Dylan talk about the situation. Mm. It's not exact from his song, but uh, afterwards, me and my, my friend Chris, who was our other guitarist at the time, uh, we started looking up more and more about like that era and that time. And we finally found, we dug up enough to be able to find, a, find about it. Ah, geez, sorry. Can't talk today. Um, but yeah. And why it fit us was kind of, we were, uh, kind of feeling like the, the outcasts, you know, like the ones who would only be here for a little while and then gone. And then when we wanted to fight for this dream, it was like, well, I mean, even if it lasts nine days, like the nine day queen, it'd still be worth it. You know, that's sick. I love the, uh, kind of the way that these themes are changing for you as it goes, like, especially what you were talking about with the groove, how this song was written like ages ago when you're in a different headspace. And now it's, it's come to mean something else, even though the song is in some ways the same at its core, the same. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like Queen Jane and this band and what it is has similarly over time kind of like shifted to mean something new for you from when it first started? Personally, I think so. When it first started, it was, I mean, that's kind of, are you guys okay with me getting into that story? It's kind of a long one, honestly, but. Sure. Yeah. Let's get the synopsis of like the original Genesis and then how everyone in this room came to be here. Okay. So the original idea was from me and my buddy from back in the day. We had lost a lot of friends and lost a lot of people in our lives. And we ended up kind of forming like a little two piece band that didn't really do much at first. And then we found some people who were willing to give us a shot at something, found some people that didn't work out. So it kind of like broke apart the first go around. Uh, and then after, I want to say four or five years of just like me continuously writing and all my friends kind of being scattered, I ended up running into Zuby, our drummer at a bonfire. And he was like, Hey, I'm in this band. I'm like, Hey, I play guitar. And he's like, I'm a drummer. I'm like, I'm a guitarist. So let's, let's get some of this stuff out and going. And, uh, he was the one who initially helped me record groove and get it out on the, on social media and stuff like that. And, uh, Later on, we ended up finding Colton, who is our bassist. And I had actually worked, like, what, two, three jobs yeah, with we you were, before? We worked a few jobs together, and we never even made the connection until the most recent one we worked together. Yeah. That we had seen each other when we took the cases. And uh, we were standing on the on assembly line all day long for, that was a Christmas break for me, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, we were talking about music, and since we just got here, I was able to stand there and talk. <laughs> we really got talking. And then he put out, we kind of, I went back to school and we went our separate ways and I had him on social media and he puts out Groove and I'm like, hey, you wrote the bass line yourself, didn't you? Let me, <laughs> let me play bass on your next one. So, and then uh, later on, uh, he ended up saying like, I have this friend who's a really, really good guitarist. I know we need another guitarist. So like, let me, let me get in touch with him. And then Lee came into the picture. So, well, I know that Queen... Queen Jane is across the ocean. Oh, well, at least was from across the ocean. Mm -hmm. But you also have a song um, that you covered, is which is called "The Ocean." Um, can you tell me uh, what who what song you're covering? Uh, the okay. song is "The Ocean" from Led Zeppelin, and we okay. I think we've all had a big inspiration from Led Zeppelin, so it just kind of suits and fits our style and vibe, and we think it's. Uh, a really rad song. <laughs> well, sick. I, I want to know, like, where you guys are all from, first of all. Uh, I'm from over by Yale, Michigan. Which okay. Is, yeah. I'm also I'm also from Yale. Yeah, me and Colton are both from St. Clair, Michigan. Technically, I'm just outside of St. Clair in a little country called China. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're we're pretty spread apart, but uh, you know we've been trying to make it work the best we can. So where's your hub when you all come together and create? Generally, it's over at my house because I have like this little uh, nook that we made into our studio that we're recording this in. 
And uh, it was actually like a, a one car garage that was turned into like a secondary living room. So it's like all wooden paneled and everything all the way around. Sick. But, yeah. So it has really nice warm sound to it. But that's that's kind of been our meeting spot for a while now. Well, sick. Um, but once again, I'm really excited to hear the cover of The Ocean by Led Zeppelin. Um, once again, this is Queen Jane and you're listening to The Basement. One, two, three. Very nice. That was the ocean. One more time. Let's give it up in the studio. We've decided on snaps. Snaps is the way to go. Clapping, it Thank doesn't translate much. on the mics. Um, well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for playing it. Um, and it sparks the interest for me. Is what you guys play as a band the same as what you all listen to in your own time? Mm. That is an excellent question. Uh, 
I feel like we have slight differences. We're all inspired by like the same, I guess. Well, we have differences within eras too, I suppose. So, I mean, we, we all like appreciate what each other appreciates, but I feel like on the general listening level, we all kind of listen to different things. Mm. Yeah, I noticed uh, Cole. Is that yeah, Colton? Yeah. Sure for Cole. Yeah. yeah, I noticed uh, on your socials you had training in jazz and funk. Oh, yeah. Um, so Lee and I <laughs> went to the same high school, and we were in uh, seventh or eighth grade. And he goes, "Hey, I'm picking up guitar, so pick up bass so we can jam. I don't want to be a long <laughs> So that's how we learned. We grew up learning together. When we got to high school, um, you know, we practiced up a lot and got into the high school jazz band, and uh, we had a really, really good band director. And we played a lot of jazz all through high school. And then um, me and my dad found an ad on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or something looking for a uh, bass player and a guitar player for a local cover band. So we, we grew up playing in bars. Um, and Lee, Lee came into that after a short minute. Um, so, yeah, I grew up playing jazz and funk in that school band. And it's I love playing that. It's fun. And you can find band members on Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, that was that was a funny story. That was uh, not that. I mean, it's done now, but we, it was a uh, it was a fun cover band that uh, went through high school and um, that, yeah, it was it was a lot of really good early exposure. We we really learned how to uh, play in front of a crowd, um, work with the crowd, have fun, you know, not just be all uptight and nervous the whole time. So. I, I also noticed that your biggest influence were Les Claypool and Joe Dart. Yeah, uh, my brother showed me a band called Volpec when I was in middle school. And he was like, if you're learning bass, you need to learn to play like this guy. And I still cannot play like him. <laughs> <laughs> he, is, he is easily like one of the greatest bass players in my head. Um, so yeah, he's, he's a funk bass player. He plays for Volpec. And then, um, who was the other one? Les Claypool? Mm -hmm. He's the bass player and lead singer for Primus. If you've never heard of them, go have a listen. That's, uh, who hasn't that's, heard of Primus? You're, Come on. You're in for a, you're in for a treat if you, if you go over to Primus. But, um, he, he just plays the, the most unique style. Nobody plays like him. Well, thank you, Cole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do these, uh, kind of disparate influences find their way into what you guys play together for all of you guys, the different perspectives and experiences that you bring in? As of right now, yeah, I mean, as of right now, it's kind of like the, the originals we're playing were stuff I had written prior to this. Mm -hmm. So but, it's more so, reflective of you and, and your it, voice. And it mainly comes through within like the covers we do and stuff like that. Cause we all have like, we have these covers that we're like, Oh, I want that one. Oh, I want that one. We need to play that one. And then it like kind of the whole show kind of becomes ours. As of right now, we're hoping to like write more together to actually kind of see that influence come through. Mm -hmm. Um, have you ever used vin vintage instruments or have you record, uh, or like, what are some recording techniques that you have, um, to get the sound that you have as a band? For, I, I feel like the, the most important thing I've found out is just different miking positions and really that's pretty much it. That's it? <laughs> because you, you got all this cool equipment, tell about it. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I would say, yeah, the most important thing I've found so far is how to try to make it organic sounding in a world full of overly compressed and I, I'm not going to down today's music at all, but uh, mm. a, a lot of the newer production styles are very like in your face and aggressive. And like that can be great for some styles of music, but I feel like there's, there's a quality of old school music that we're kind of losing, I suppose in nowadays where it felt like you were just in the room with them. You weren't at a concert necessarily. You were just there while they were playing. And I feel like that, natural organic sound is what i'm trying to capture throughout all this so very simple in, inputs and outputs you know just all everything mic'd up not really too much going on throughout most of the production process well i want to bounce off that uh how do you feel about the evolution of rock from the 70s uh, to today in 2024 mm, it's back and forth like i i have a lot of artists that i really you know admire and enjoy nowadays too but i will say like i do feel like we've kind of lost a little bit of the authenticity, I'll say, because it's become so competitive, I think is the main reason. So like everybody needs to be kind of a step above the next to be able to stand out nowadays. There's millions of artists, you know, but uh, so I, I think maybe we've turned a little bit more into a numbers game and a social media game more than uh, focus on the music and getting a good song out type of game. That's, I, that's probably the main difference I've noticed, at least. Well, that breaks my heart. 
I mean, it's interesting to think, though, like as much as the world has progressed and music has changed and the styles that are popular continue to evolve, like this music still Mm -hmm. speaks to you. Oh, absolutely. And it's been so many decades. And I don't know, is there any like distillable kind of core element to it beyond just like the the dynamic that it plays socially, you know, of, of how we're consuming that music? But like, I guess for all of you guys, the music that you enjoy what about it resonates with you would you care to go um yeah i don't know i mean it is just it's the classic rock feel i mean it's it's the it's the i want to hang out with my friends and i want to get my guitar pick it up plug it into a big amp and turn it up and play (laughs) i just love the raw emotion yeah it's it's just it's just like power in your hands um it's it's just anything it's the satisfaction you can the most satisfaction you can get uh playing guitars there's this music. Hmm. Yeah, I just I feel like soul resonates more with the people who haven't really needed to focus on numbers and things like that. So like I don't, I'm not trying to like downplay any of today's music. I have a lot of artists of today that I like, but um I don't know the the raw side of things where it's like not as computer generated I suppose. I guess I'll put because it's like you know you have a little help here, a little, a little help there. It kind of like changes that emotion from something that was organic into something that doesn't maybe feel the same as like what the initial artist went to intend. So like having a guitar in your hands and just cranking it up to 11 and seeing all the the flaws and everything that come out of it. To me, that's more like, I guess that's where like my emotional side comes out. Cause it's like, I'm feeling that like, even if he messed up, it's like, that's where he was in that moment, you know? So. And Eric, you jumped in for a second. What artists are your influences in, and what about them do you most enjoy? I uh, would say uh, lately it's been Rush, The Strokes, Mac DeMarco, stuff like that. So, yeah, I just love how th- just the raw emotion, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, Lee, did you have any any other influences you wanted to mention too? Yeah, well, so I grew up basically as like one of the biggest metalheads you could find in school, you know, in a school where everyone's listening to rap. So I definitely stuck out, you know, like a Thorsum. <laughs> and um, I don't know, it's evolved over time. But I think for me, it's always just been about emotion. Anytime I pick up my guitar, it's about the emotion. I love when guitars are fast and shredding, but I can still feel like the emotion in that kind of side of things. And, you know, ever since I've got out of high school and got to college just kind of went more to the chill side of things pink floyd's like my favorite band now i love david gilmore to death he's probably one of my biggest influences and i don't know just something about the way he can make the guitar speak is just what inspires me to pick it up so so lee do you feel like you were born in the wrong generation (laughs) unfortunately yes (laughs) well give it up (laughs) give it up now can you tell us what you're giving up exactly uh Maybe not over air. <laughs> no, honestly, that that song kind of felt relatable to me in multiple categories. It was like, you know, the idea of just like kind of caving into something, calling out to you. It's it, To me, that was like, you know, there is there is a reason. I'd rather not get into that right now. But uh, for the most part, I feel like it's just relatable in all categories in regards to wanting something to like happen naturally and just being like caving into it you know all right yeah. do you feel like you could try and keep that like ambiguity in your songs where like it could mean anything it could go a thousand ways i would like to continue to try yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well once again this is queen jane and you are gonna listen to give it up
you're talking to me Oh Quack, quack, talking in the key But I won't continue to get to me Backseat season and a long ride season For a little geek Cup guard searching for the nightlife Loving in the city streets Keep it on the low Cause the lights are going slow By the window seat Keep your wild eyes Keep it 